so far we are centering a conversation around what it means to create opera, what it means to do this work. Identity has always been at the center of operatic storytelling. We sense it in the characters, we hear it in the music, and as both artists and audiences, we find the connections and points of discovery. What does this mean for an opera field's ebbing consciousness of the impact and nuance of racial, ethnic, and cultural identity? New Orleans Opera has gathered, as we said, an expert panel of composers and conductors to discuss the implications of the question posed by New York Times opinion writer, John McWhorter, can white men write black opera? So of course, I cannot possibly do each of our wonderful panelists justice in introducing them. So I always love to have people introduce themselves. Uh, so I will have each of them tell us who they are as well as what first sparked their interest in composition and their most profound cultural memory. So what sparks your interest in composition and what is something that you remember from your culture, from your identity? What's the most profound, joyous memory that you have? And we will begin with Dr. Cynthia Cosette Lee. Good Go evening, good evening. Uh, my game, name again is Dr. Cynthia Cosette Lee. I'm a classical music contemporary composer, librettist, producer, and author residing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thank you all for allowing me to participate in this distinguished uh, group of uh, panelists. I'm very excited about being here. I'm a classical composer who has composed uh, four operas. I've written over 150 chamber orchestra works, uh, also choral and vocal. Um, I produce my own operas and um, I've used such world-class singers as Hazelita Fontroy or Dr. Carl Dupont. And um, I, some of my compositions have received national awards and international performances. Um, I have some exciting projects coming up for 2023. I will be self-publishing my own music. So if anyone's out there who wants my music, I will be publishing it. And also I'll be working with the Women of Africa in 2023. Now I am also a performer for flute and piano. And um, I'm very grateful this year to Opera Creole who has presented my opera and also the Washington National Opera Summer Institute uh, has presented um, excerpts from my opera. And um, I was the first black to graduate from the University of Pennsylvania and the first woman to graduate from the University of Pennsylvania with a master's of art degree in music composition. Now, what sparked my interest in music composition? Oh, when I was about five years old, I used to listen to holiday programs and I would hear choir sing, ask my mom, well, why, why does it sound like the soloist is sounding louder than the choir or softer sometimes? And so my mother immediately recognized that I had a strong interest in classical music and she saw to it that I, had the best professors in Pittsburgh where I was from and that included Duquesne University Professor Carmen Ramo on piano, Pittsburgh Symphony members, um, Alois Raybach on flute, uh, Charles Lee Belt on violin. Um, later the Pittsburgh Flute Club came in and supported me. I had community support. They provided free lessons for me to study with Bernard Goldberg. I received a scholarship. They awarded me a composition prize. So I was very fortunate to come from a strong family and I uh, had community uh, support. Um, were you interested also in my most memorable cultural experience? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Was seeing my first opera on television, Willis Patterson singing the role of King Balthasar in Minotti's Alma and the Night Visitor. That totally impacted my life with the world of opera. Also as a teenager, I was able to volunteer with the Pittsburgh Opera as the properties committee 
uh, person. And um, my girlfriend's father was the stage manager of the Pittsburgh Opera at that time. But I saw, well, where are the black? Hello, Willis Patterson is there. I've heard of Marian Anderson, but where are these people? I don't see them. And where are the black opera stories? So at that point in, in my career music, um, I decided I'm going to be a composer to write opera stories with black themes in it and to hire black singers and musicians so that they too get their story heard. Beautiful. So that sort of sums it up for me. <laughs> and thank you for that beautiful summary of such a beautiful and amazing and powerful legacy, Dr. Lee. Uh, I so very much appreciate um, you providing us with the information of who you are and then allowing us to kind of see the journey of how you got to where you are and what is so meaningful for you. So thank you so much for that. I am going to You're ask welcome. the same question to our other panelists. I am going to ask Michael, can you let us know who you are? Let us know uh, what, sparked, what sparked your work and your most profound cultural memory. Thank you, Quo. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, when Tara and I met in advance to, to talk about me participating in this panel, we, we were just vamping for hours and, and it had some really inspiring conversation. My name is Michael Ellis Ingram. I'm a conductor, a composer, and educator. Right now, I'm uh, conducting the premiere of Carmen at Portland Opera, uh, production designed by Denise Graves. And I am based in Hamburg, Germany, where I teach conducting at the conservatory there. And so I, I live there and I spend most of my time there, but I'm starting to spend a bit more time in the United States as well, uh, working with different opera companies. Um, but I don't just do opera. I love to conduct operetta, musical theater, ballet, concerts, children's concerts. Um, I love almost every style of music that exists, uh, also outside of the classical world, whether it's rap or Swedish folk music or um, Polish pop music from the 70s, any type of music I, I find fascinating, especially music that I haven't heard before. Um, so uh, a, a significant memory that sort of launched me into being a musician was when I saw Fantasia, the 1940s version as a child and seeing the silhouette of Stokowski, this magical maestro um, creating not only music, but color and light that thrilled me. And I think uh, from that moment, subconsciously at first, uh, I wanted to be a part of something like that. Uh, and then as time went on, I began to fall in love with the storytelling power of music and shifted uh, away from conducting just symphonic music and into uh, a what I hope is a lifelong love affair with opera and all types of storytelling, theater, music. Um, and let's see, a, a significant cultural experience. Well, I'll tell you a very recent one. I was conducting Porgy and Bess. Uh, by the way, farewell performance of, of Simon Estes. He was singing Gloria Fraser this summer at Des Moines Metro Opera. And my colleagues were uh, working on a different piece, a world premiere called A Thousand Acres, uh, written by Christine Custer, who's a composer, and Mark Campbell, the librettist. And I've never had a more powerful and moving experience with an audience uh, than I did at the premiere of that work. When it was time for intermission, nobody wanted to move or breathe or speak. The story had uh, not just mesmerized us, but it, it, had, uh, it had paralyzed us. We, we were in awe of the storytelling and collectively so moved. And it was no comparison to when Carmen dies. It was no comparison to when Tosca dies. It was no comparison to when Brunhilde dies. It was something different. And uh, it was the power of the storytelling and it was seeing people on stage who, who might as well have been in the audience. It was, it was like a, a mirror. And seeing, seeing that story was, was so powerful, so powerful. And it reminded me of what I love about opera. Thank you so very much for, again, another kind of rich uh, allowing of us to see who you are, to witness what matters to you, and then for that beautiful kind of, not just summation, but evidence of what opera can do to be paralyzed. No one wants to move, no one wants to breathe, no one wants to speak. And how often do our audiences actually get to engage in such a way? So thank you so much for bringing your voice into the space. I'm so excited for this conversation. My pleasure, thank you. Absolutely. And of course, Dylan, let us know 
who you are, what inspires or sparked the interest for your work, and of course, a cultural memory. I'll do my best. Um, I, my name is Dylan Tran. I'm a, a composer and, and multimedia artist. Um, I love to play in, in really any, any medium I can get my hands on um, and anything that is collaborative and uh, fun. Um, as far as what sparked my interest in composition, I, I do not have a, a very clear memory of it, but my mom tells me that there was this movie from the 60s called uh, That Thing You Do. Um, Y'all are probably too young to remember it, but it was kind of like a, a doo-woppy, you know, 60s boy band kind of thing. And she tells a story about how I went into the kitchen, I took all of the pots and pans and, you know, took chopsticks from our, uh, you know, utensils, and I would play along with the, the movie. Um, and that kind of led into garage bands and rock bands and funk bands. And, uh, you know, I'd always written songs and things like that as a kid. Uh, they weren't very great. But uh, when I moved into college and sort of discovered classical music um, in New Orleans, that songwriting kind of turned into composition and other forms of exploration. Uh, and then about a decade later, uh, here we are. Um, as far as a profound cultural memory, um, that's kind of hard for me. I feel like I make, I'm making new ones all the time. And I, I think for me, the, the most uh, special heartwarming aspect of, of my culture is how uh, welcoming people have been to me, specifically, um, you know, other Vietnamese people. Um, I, my family was very Americanized, and that has a lot to do with my, my dad's own, uh, you know, immigration and refugee journey. So we don't speak the language. Uh, we, you know, don't know much about the history. Uh, but a few years ago, I started, you know, learning the language myself, learning about the history. And man, I tell you, the amount of, of, you know, people around, Vietnamese people around the country in Chicago, Cincinnati, Los Angeles, um, in New Orleans, who, you know, when I tell them and I start to speak to them, they are just so immediately open and welcoming. And they've invited me into their homes and into their kids' first communions and, uh, you know, family parties and into their lives. And it's, um, it's something that I'm, I'm very proud of in my culture that that welcomeness and it's something I'm I'm very grateful for also. Thank you so much Dylan for bringing your voice into the space. I love that the cultural memory is the ability to continuously make cultural memories. I love that so very much. I am going to invite all of our panelists to join us in the conversation. So we get to see and hear who people are, what brought them to this work. What I would like to now ask, and I'm gonna point this toward uh, Michael first, can you let us know kind of what, what kind of uh, sources do you use for your work now? As a composer, as a conductor, what in particular kind of drives and informs your work? Uh, so when I'm composing, mostly I compose on a smaller scale. So writing for children's theater, writing incidental music for spoken theater. And I always start with the text and usually with the place. Uh, so a recent piece I did was uh, about Panama. And so just that key word um, gave me a whole tapestry of styles of music to work with. Um, and then I'm always working with the text in, in German mostly, and also a German dialect spoken in the northern part of the country where I live. Um, and yeah, I mean, my, my motto as a composer, if I'm composing to text, is in the beginning was the word. So I always start with the text. I start with the speech rhythms. I start with the meaning of the text. And my goal is to create music that shapes the text in a way that allows the actor or the singer to be dramatic with it. Um, so I'm thinking, how would someone recite this if it were not music, if it were just straight text? Uh, what kind of dramatic impulses would they be would would they be having while they're delivering the line? And then I try to compose that because there's nothing worse than hearing, <laughs> you, you know, you hear some new operas, none written by anyone on this call, by the way. <laughs> you you occasionally hear new operas where it sounds like a wrestling match between the text and the music, and I don't like that. 
I want it to sound like a seamless melding of the two. And when the singer gets to it, I want it to feel like they're being carried as if I've made their, their work easier because of the way that I've set the text. So that's my, that's my goal. And small scale stuff, maybe I'll write an opera one day, I'm not sure. When I think about the idea of that, I, I, my first reaction is, but there are so many operas that are already there that, that need to be conducted. So I'd rather busy myself with that at the moment. Uh, and then inspiration for, op for when I'm conducting an opera, actually it's, it's the same thing, in the beginning was the word. I'm always looking, at, because the text existed before the music, and when the text came across across the composer's deck, desk, something about it started to glow and burn and move. And so I want to get back to that. What is it about the text that made this composer have no choice but to compose? And even someone like Verdi coming out of retirement for Artello, it was because of the text. He read the text and he couldn't not compose. And I want to experience the text in that same way, with that same power, because often text is the last thing you think about as a, as a conductor. Um, but yeah, I'm always trying to get at the text, to get at the psychology of the characters, to get at the drama, to get at the story. I love it. And thank you for naming kind of also the psychology of the characters to get to the drama of the story um, and being true to the story in a way, right? Paraphrasing, um, and then allowing that to drive things. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Lee, who or what informs your work now? Well, as I said, as a child, the Minotti influence with the Alma and the Night Visitor and all of his operas. And Minotti went on later in my life to influence me in that my composition teacher at Carnegie Mellon University was a student at Curtis in composition with Samuel Barber and Giancarlo Minotti. So I heard many stories about uh, Maestro Minotti. And when I came to Philadelphia, I'd met him maybe a half dozen times. Uh, the first time I met him uh, was with the uh, dramatic soprano was present, Hazelita Fauntroy, who was performing in his opera at the Academy of Music. But when I got to college, I found out I needed something more. I had gone to all white universities and I wasn't getting, I was missing as a black classical composer, I was missing something. So I began to research the black nationalist composers like R. Nathaniel Dett, William Grant Steele, the Renaissance composers and Florence Price. I mean, these composers um, so impacted my whole uh, style of writing so that I continue to use melodies and harmonies in my uh, 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 format as a composer because the time I came along there was a war going on between uh, atonal and tonal music and so that is one reason why I went to the University of Pennsylvania to study with George Rockberg who believed tonal music not atonal uh, was the all, being in all of music. But um, basically it's the black uh, nationalist composers, the Harlem Renaissance composers, and also the French Impressionists, the WC, the Ravel that highly influenced my style and even today still influenced my style of composing. Beautiful, thank you very much for sharing. And you know, I, to add, I often say a quote that if it wasn't for Marian Anderson or Paul Robeson or Julia Perry or William Grant Steele going ahead and saying in the classical music field, there would be no Cynthia Cosette Lee <laughs> because I stand on their shoulders. Yeah. And, um, and this is very important. It's important to know the history of where you're coming from so that you receive the most meaningful inspiration for the here and now. I mean, that's my own philosophy. You may agree or disagree, but. I'm gonna snap to that because I'm gonna agree. And it's <laughs> because it's important to know the history and take a holistic approach. I appreciate like you to know the history, to learn the history and let it be what it is because you can't change it. And to be yeah. mindful of the impact that it has now and the impact in the ways that we are living, breathing, engaging, experiencing art now. So thank you so much for that. Dylan, let us know kind of who, what informs your work right now. I just wanna um, uh, shout out to Dr. Lee, Dr. Um, Cosette Lee real quick, because Ravel is one of my favorite composers. And uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I love him so much 
is because he was um, mixed culturally. His father was from France and his mother was Basque. And you hear that um, just really beautifully balanced in his music, how he drew on his, his cultural uh, background from both places and, and created these just gorgeous works that kind of move in between these two cultures, but are also in them at the same time and also in other places as well. Um, I could talk about Ravel all day, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, what informs my work? I have, I have two answers. Um, my first is, is it's, my work tends to, is it, my work is sometimes need based. Um, so for example, my, my very first opera was a, a chamber piece uh, commissioned by Loyola University and their opera program had just tons of sopranos and mezzos and not many basses and tenors. And so uh, the way I went about that was to write a piece that utilized, I think about six or seven soprano mezzo voices um, and just had fun with that. And uh, so I, I think uh, you know addressing uh, practical needs is a big inspiration for me. Um, and my second answer is that it's kind of just whatever is going on in my life. Um, you know, when, I, when I've been through periods of sort of a cultural reclamation, that's when I've put out my pieces like my string quartet, which is based on Vietnamese themes, um, or the, the piece that I, I finished a song cycle based on poems by Ocean Wong, a Vietnamese American composer, um, that New Orleans opera will, will premiere actually in, uh, in March, I think. Um, but when I'm, when I'm on a mental health kick, and I'm deciding to like go hard with my therapist, then I've, you know, gotten, that's when I've put out my pieces about ah, sort of like doing inner child work and, and looking into that. And then of course I love nature and uh, I'm here in Los Angeles right now because the Choral Arts Institute is premiering a piece of mine called Tupelo Poems, which is a, a choral suite that is uh, basically a love letter to the Southeastern landscape. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of inspired by just whatever happens in my life, all the little things, car rides with siblings, um, you know, strangers on the street saying mean stuff to me or saying nice stuff to me. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm easily moved by many things. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And so you all have kind of let us know some of the things that you hope people experience when you're doing your work, when you're composing, when you're conducting, when you're engaging. We heard those things. What I would like to ask each of you actually, and Dylan, we'll come back to you. <laughs> We're just gonna spin it back to you. Um, can you, you just kind of spoke of it as well. Can you let us know a bit more about how your ethnicity, how your identity, this is a conversation about can white men write black opera? Uh, in your case, it would be, you know, Asian American opera. Can you let us know how much your identity influences your work? I uh, think it has a, a huge influence. I mean, in, um, you know, in diversity work, we talk a lot about lived experience, um, which is literally to live an experience. And so to, if you are writing about an experience, um, you know, I, I would be bold to posit perhaps that having lived it uh, provides just a degree of, uh, you know, a, a, a further degree of authenticity and of ownership of that story. Um, uh, and it's, I mean, it's just, and it's not just in, you know, the, it's not just in things that are culturally idiomatic. It's not just when writing Asian American pieces that this happens, you know, it's, there are many parts of me and they all uh, feed into all the other parts and they all kind of pop up in all, all the different mediums and, and places. But overall, it's, it's got a huge role. It's a huge part of my life. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I ask the same question now. I'm going to work backwards so we'll get to you, right? So now we're going to go back to <laughs> Dr. Lee and then Michael. How much does your identity influence your work and how you engage with operatic work, how you engage with any type of art? Well, in my experience, the technique and skills that go into learning to be a classical composer has nothing to do with ethnicity and culture. 
what where culture comes into it is when you're telling that story in the opera, when you're telling the story in the art song. So for example, I lived in Puerto Rico for three years and I've written songs in Spanish and English. And also I have a, a theme of a Mexican family in my opera, the black guitar, how they struggle along and, and face poverty every day. And this reminds me of, I don't know if you've seen the Lorraine Hansberry play To Be Young, Gifted and Black, but um, Lorraine Hansberry found a universal theme of humanity, I believe. I don't know if that's exact quote that she used, but um, in um, writing her A Raisin in the Sun play, she first was inspired by Sean O'Casey's The Plow and the Stars, because she noticed there was there's something about humanity that there are universal themes that transcend. So in her culture, in her black culture, she was able to take the framework um, of humanity and bring it into her raisin in the sun. So this is sort of what I'm trying to do as a composer with my storytelling and my operas that some I write my librettas to, some um, I collaborate with my sister, Dr. Hazel Lee, who is a poet author also in a librettist. So I've been fortunate in that regard. And uh, that's basically how I feel about uh, ethnicity and composing. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Michael. Let us know how does the how do these things show up? Do they show up? Does it inform your work? Does it influence the work? What does that mean for you? Until a couple of years ago, I I never really answered the question, and I was never interested in it. I, I didn't want to be considered a black conductor. I just wanted to be considered a good conductor. And uh, the question, what's it like to be a black conductor, always just seemed odd. I thought, well, well, when I compare it to the the time I was a, a, a female white conductor, then, you know, it's a, it's a, I am what I am. And that's the only version of, of my of my uh, life and career that I know. Um, but a few years back, uh, partly because of Black Lives Matter and protests around the world, including uh, in Germany, young people took to the streets in Germany. Um, I started just revisiting the question, what does it mean to be a, a black conductor? What does it mean to be a black man at all? And just sort of letting my life uh, as it were, passed before my eyes and just reconsidering so many experiences from, from childhood. And I had a very privileged upbringing, um, but there was racism everywhere, but I didn't realize it at the time. And so as an adult, looking back at my childhood, as an adult living in Germany, looking back at my childhood in America, um, it, I was able to look back almost as a stranger, as a third party. And I just began putting the pieces together in a way which was very moving and enlightening. It helped me under, understand what's going on in the United States. It helped me understand what goes on in my own psyche when I think about myself, reflect about myself, or when I interact with other black people or other black artists. Um, also, I started spending more time trying to understand where are the black stories? where are the black operas where are the black composers um because if you th think about how we learned about music we learn about white european male music and there are occasional rock stars who show up like clara schumann a woman like scott joplin a black man but they they feel like they're proving the rule and so you grow up with the idea or you are educated with the idea, whether explicit or implicit, that either there weren't any black composers or they just weren't very good. And then I started just doing some digging and trying to figure out, well, okay, who was the first? Oh, I found them one that was from the 19th century. Oh, wait, I found one that was from the 18th century. And now I'm finding one in the 17th century. Now I'm, I mean, the earliest one I found now is a black Portuguese Renaissance composer. And as I've been digging into that and also doing a lot of work, almost more work with female composers than with black composers, they are everywhere and they never stopped composing. The music is there just waiting to be discovered. It's in archives, it's in attics and basements, it's in libraries, it's in institutes. It's being researched by people who are doing their doctorates. And I, as a conductor, I'm interested in the research and all of that. And I love archives and libraries. I want it to sound 
I want it to be on the note, uh, on the music stands. Uh, and so I, I've been doing research on that and visiting different archives and, and trying to talk to different people and discovering part of the reason why this music is, is buried, as it were, hidden in plain sight. There are just layers of difficulty. There's no publisher or there is a publisher who has exclusive rights and so it's unaffordable uh, or the manuscript is lost and so you have to reconstruct it somehow or there is a manuscript but it has a, literally a piece torn off of it so okay we need a composer conductor to come in and try to fill in the blanks and and i'm trying to get in touch with the heirs but the heirs are non-musicians and they don't understand how things work or they are guarding this material jealously or they don't know about their they, there are so many layers, especially with black composers and female composers from history, so many barriers and hurdles. And with each new hurdle I encounter, the more urgent I feel about getting to the music. Um, and yet that, that was a big revelation to me. It's not because the music's bad. It's not because it's not there. It's just because it's, it's buried in plain sight and you have to roll up your sleeves and figure a lot of things out. Uh, to make that work. So my most recent research pro projects have been about female composers and about composers who were uh, exiled or murdered during the Third Reich in uh, Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I've just discovered untold treasures and I'm really excited at the prospect of the music sounding at last. I love that, the music sounding at last. And thank you for also um, speaking truth to the fact that suddenly right there's this thing that's happening in the opera field and in many fields suddenly we're finding all of the the black composers the female composers the fill in the blank composers as if people were not there what we are learning is that the story has been controlled the story the canon all of it the access that we have have has been controlled and has been controlled in such a way that it creates those additional layers where now we have to go back and try to undo some of the systemic things that took place now I have to go back and talk to the heirs. I have to go back and see if we can find it. I have to go back and uh, see if we can reconstruct those things because when they were presented uh, or a, a bit of time after they presented as we look at the mid 20th century as well, they were silenced, intentionally silenced. So I appreciate each of you kind of sharing how much of your, your identities inform not just your work but the engagement with other people's work who either share your identity or have different identities. In this, of course, none of us can speak for an entire group. We know that race is a construct. We know that it has real impact. So we don't get to pretend like it doesn't exist because it does. Even if we want to say it doesn't, it does, right? Even as what you just shared, and I believe even if we don't see it, we start to um, have some type of engagement with it, no matter where we are on this globe, on this planet. And we can't speak for an entire group. So I will ask each of you, before we get to can white people write uh, fill in the blank opera, uh, black opera, Asian American opera, what is black opera? What does that even mean to you as creators, as engagers, as historians as well? What does that even mean to you? And then Dylan will ask, what does Asian American opera mean to you? I'm going to pass it to Dr. Lee, and then we'll have uh, Michael and then Dylan. Okay, thank you. Um, very good question. Um, I have found in my experience that we need to be careful with the use of terminology and words. Um, for instance, what Black opera means to you or me or to Michael or Dylan is different from maybe what it means to someone else. So I believe opera is an international art form that originated in Europe, the operas we're talking about today. Um, the black classical composer experience with opera has gone back hundreds of years. And also with that, there has been discrimination. Uh, for instance, with Chevalier de Saint-Georges or Joseph Bologna, uh, who wrote six operas and uh, almost ended up the director of the Paris Opera, but we know the story that the a few of the singers complained they didn't want a mulatto uh, directing them. So as a result, he was not chosen as the director of the Paris Opera. And this has gone down for centuries in the mainstream of opera. So I think it's very important. It was uh, like Michael was saying about, well, I just want to be a good conductor. Well, I want to be just a great writer of opera 
who's telling stories of black themes, who's telling stories of um, uh, of black uh, uh, um, things that have happened in our society because these stories need to be told. They need to be brought out. But when you say, well, black opera, well, then you have to look at the opposite. Well, what is white opera? <laughs> and so it, it gets really complicated because today opera is global. It's a global art form uh, written in many languages uh, by many composers of African, European, Asian, and other ethnic groups. So we have to be careful. We're not doing a narrow by saying well black opera you know we're, we're nearing our, our scope of everything but yes there has been historic discrimination against the black musicians and the singers and the black composers joining the mainstream of opera and and it concerns me that we now have this term black opera and the meaning it depends on who you're speaking with what it means so I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but not yet. Um, but I'm, a, I'm. We're gonna get there. <laughs> yeah, that's, so that's what does it mean? It. <laughs> yeah. What does it mean to you? Because you share, of course, the hysteric, the historic discrimination, the current as well, right? Which is why we're in the space and the conversation that we're having. And even as there was the exact separation, it can mean very different things. It may mean something different than it may mean to everybody else on the call. Uh, but as we look at it for you, how do you know or how do you feel or have a connection uh, with Blackness when it comes to opera? Is it the composer? Is it the, the text? Is it the subject, right? As we look at universal and kind of human-centered uh, approaches to works, how do you know or feel when there is, ah, this is Black, this is opera? So I'm, I'm turning it back to you, Dr. Lee. <laughs> and then oh, we'll go to Michael. Well, again, I go back to the reverse. Well, what is white opera? <laughs> what, what we've been okay. getting. What is white opera to you then? What we've been receiving, right? right. But, and, so, and, and so in this, when we ask the question of, right, what is black opera? What is white opera? To get to the question of who can write Black opera or who can write Asian American opera, we've been having the discussion about experiences. We've been having the discussion, and Dylan brought up in such a beautiful way, authenticity and what it means for one to speak to one's own experience. So it, I do not believe, but of course I'm the moderator, so this is a this isn't a quote conversation. Uh, but I do not believe that uh, it, we can and should limit ourselves to just text, just context, just composer, but it gives us the opportunity to hear from people who are directly impacted by the construct of race, disproportionately impacted by the construct of race, to then have our voices centered in this conversation, because it has not been centered thus far. It has been other people writing about other people's experiences. So we now have the opportunity to get to say, well, this is what I think it means, knowing that it doesn't mean everything for everyone, knowing that the next black person next to me, the next Asian American person next to me might have something completely different to say, but this is our opportunity to let it as using Michael's words, to let it sound. Right. Well, my, again, my prom problem is that the, I think the phrase is ambiguous in that, mm -hmm. are you talking about, well, the black composers of opera have not been heard are you talking about, well, the black opera singers have not been heard. I know opera singers who had to go abroad. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we know the conductors, the Dean Dixons that had to go abroad, uh, uh, Everett Lees who have had to go abroad in order to build a classical music career successfully. So um, you can look at, well, it could be opera singers who are black who had to go abroad. Mm -hmm. It could be composers who are black, who have been denied opportunities. Um, it could be uh, conductors who are black, who have been denied opportunities. So, um, it, it, so again, it, it depends on specifically what I'm, I'm talking about or what you are talking about. So in reference to that, if you're talking about the discrimination and level of discrimination, particularly oh, to no, the black no. not just not just discrimination. You know. We're just talking about in being in existing, whether we've received it and been able to engage or not. So right, it doesn't because, have to be from a space of discrimination. Because the question is about, uh, for instance, Porgy and Bess, is that black opera? Is it? 
Is That's it, what I'm it? asking you. Oh, no, no. I ask you. I'm right. a mother. Well, when, I, when I hear <laughs> Black opera, I'm assuming you're talking about operas that have been composed by Black composers um, telling Black things and stories. That's okay. what I have in mind. Nice, um, nice. Yeah. So, well, then that, that answers the but question. But then if you look at, if you limit that, then we'll Porgy and Bess obviously is an opera about Black things and stories. So uh -huh. is that Black opera? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's telling the story of, uh, for instance, I think Dream Girls also, it's a musical, but that's another production, I believe, by white songwriters. So uh, that tells a Black story. Uh -huh. So is that Black musical? Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> so, so yeah, well, and what you've done is provided a beautiful opportunity for us to consider the complexities, again, of a very complex question and more so of what counts as fill in the blank. Is it the context? Is it the performers? Is it the voice that is actually giving sound to what is happening? Is it the audience? Is it the intended audience, right? In those different spaces. So I appreciate that so much, Dr. Lee. It looks like we just lost Michael and I'll wait for him to come back. But in the meantime, I'm gonna pass the question to Dylan. Just in your, your opinion, right? You don't speak for anybody other than Dylan, uh, just for yourself, kind of, <laughs> I love this laugh. Uh, how would you define um, Asian American opera? How would you define opera or voice or composition for Dylan? Yeah, um, so I, I will definitely answer this question. I just wanna do a tiny preface to say that I, I agree that that the terminology, like I don't, honestly, I don't even like the term opera because I feel like that narrows it down to this like European thing that started the specific era, as if there was not music drama happening, all as if there were not. You better speak about it, Dylan. You better speak the truth on the stage. <laughs> okay, I'm back. As if there were not stories being told through music um, in indigenous cultures, but also in all in all cultures. Um, but as far as if this specific context, the question, what is Asian American opera? I would say um, I would I would maybe not frame it as a binary, as something being like this is or is not, but perhaps it exists on a spectrum. And, you know, at one end, the, the least Asian American opera is not about an Asian American experience or by those people. Um, and the but the most Asian American, you know, music drama, the most Asian American artwork is one that I believe speaks to the Asian American experience with authenticity and uh, genuineness and is also crafted in uh, in that spirit and maybe even in those means. Um, so I think that would, that would be my answer, that I, I, I would reframe it not as a binary, but as kind of a spectrum of, I, I would say, how Asian American is this art? Um, <laughs> And even then that would not have a, a clear answer, you know, that, that'd be more of a converse, much like this one, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's my take. <laughs> Thank you for that. In that it's not a direct clear answer, but what I am hearing is what is the intent of the work? What is the inspiration of the work? And what is the impact? So as we pull into conversations, Dr. Lee brought in uh, Porgy and Bess, um, as we know, one of the kind of most prominent uh, Asian identity operas in the canon right now that a lot of people are having conversations about, Madama Butterfly. In these, both of these instances, we have, per, in just in general, white men writing about other experiences. And the impact that it had at the time the reason, the intention of the story at the time, the impact that it had at the time, the impact that it has now. So it brings us to an opportunity to start to consider, does this count as fill in the blank opera? Is this, for example, Porgy and Bess, is this black opera? Is this an opera about black people written by white men? Which it absolutely is. Does that count as black opera? And, in the impact that it has then and the impact that it has now, does it provide, and I love what you said, Dylan, um, kind of this beautiful opportunity for it to be authentic, for it to speak to the experiences of the people in the space in a meaningful way. 
And does it provide opportunity for us to build on it? I will add that, right? That question, does it provide opportunity for us to build and to clean voice in the space? Or are we still limited within a particular view or perspective or tonality in some ways in order to tell stories, right? So I now kind of turn our full on question to, um, to our question at hand, our focus to the question at hand. Can white men or anybody, right? Can white men in particular, white people in particular, write black opera? Oh, before, Dylan, you have your hand up, go for it. Uh, well, Michael has come back if you wanted come to- Come back, uh, Michael. He, he's, he's back. Hello, yes, Michael. thank you. <laughs> you wanted to send Hello, the I definition question. Oh, yay, Michael's back. Welcome back, Michael. So before we get to that question, then I would like for you, if you're okay with it, to kind of share what does Black opera mean to you? How do you define? Uh, just for yourself, of course, not for everybody, but for yourself. What yes. Is it? Thank you so much. The hotel internet, uh, I just fell asleep for a moment. You know, it'd be like that. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I, will, I will tell you what thrills me most about black opera and that is the possibility of telling compelling stories that haven't yet been told through opera and uh, if you think of a topic as lady we know that that's powerful operatic material because we have pieces like nabucco or pieces like aida where that where slavery is, is a driving element of the plot and of the fates of the characters so we know that that there are operatic stories hidden in the Black experience, That's hidden, but uh, just waiting to be discovered, waiting to be uh, uh, brought to the, to the operatic stage. Not to say it hasn't been done before, it has. I'm thinking of, of Anthony Davis's Amistad and other pieces, but there are so and with centuries of stories, centuries of stories um, that, that, that will soon be told. I'm thinking also of, of Reed Giddens or Abel's Omar. Um, and slavery just being one aspect uh, to, to to turn the to turn this pr perspective around a bit. Uh, a couple seasons ago, I was working on Trouble in Tahiti. This this uh, one act opera by Leonard Bernstein from the fifties. And as I was looking at the opera, which is about upper mid upper middle class nineteen fifties white folks who have everything their hearts could desire, but they're still unhappy. When I think about Leonard Bernstein choosing that as a subject, and I think, okay, well, it's an obvious subject because in the 1950s, nothing was going on in the world. Um, I mean, except for the Red Scare and oh, uh, the Lavender Scare, uh, the Cold War, the Korean War, threat of atomic uh, nuclear holocaust, civil rights, Emmett Till. Uh, did I forget anything? So, I, so, so I'm reflecting on the topic that he thought was important to write about at that time against the backdrop of what was really going on in the world. And I think Black composers and librettists are extremely interested on that backdrop, which for us as minorities was never a backdrop. It's just our life. Um, so there are so many stories, whether from the 1950s or from the 1720s or from yesterday, which uh, will be brought to the operatic stage. And it will, it will change the art form because what I also love about Black opera, it's not, this is what opera is, and we're, we're just cracking the door open and letting some Black stories escape <laughs> in, inside of it. The genre must expand because the stories will change the way the storytelling works. The stories will change the stagecraft, the stories will change the musical styles that are employed and the musical forces that are being used in the pit. The stories will change the, the style of voices you use. You know, Wagnerian sopranos did not exist before Wagner composed his operas. He composed music that, that required voices that had never existed before. And so I look forward to that as I think about the black operas being discovered and written now and those that will be written in the future. Maybe in five, 10, 20, 50 years, we won't even recognize the art form because it will have been revolutionized by the inclusion of stories which had long been ignored. Speak a word on this day. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for also adding right perspective. And as we have heard from all of our panelists, we all have 
different approaches to what this means. Um, what I am seeing is a common thread of the creativity that is already in place, right? We don't have to earn it. It is already there. It is, it is present. I am seeing the agency necessary for us to not just break through, but for us to claim the space which is happening and which has been happening and will continue to happen so that there is a greater approach, not just to what is Black opera, what is Black American opera, what is Asian American opera, but who are the voices we have in the space, right? We get to this question because we have not had enough voices in the space. We get to this question because we have not had enough audiences in the space to then determine whether or not this work is meaningful for them. So I love that this leads us to that final question. And of course, again, this is a difficult question and uh, more so just a broader question. Do you feel that white people can write Black opera? Um, for Dylan, do you feel that white people can write Asian American opera, vice versa? right? Uh, as we look at what that means, do you feel that others can write an opera, a story uh, about another's experience? And do you feel that such stories should be centered above those who have authentic voice? I'm going to go to Dylan first. Hey, um, you know, I, I, I'll preface this by saying I think what I hear a lot of people say when you ask this kind of question is they say, um, well, what about the converse? What about the inverse? Can't, so no one can write about anybody. And uh, I think that comments like that don't acknowledge the very real existence of what is called a power dynamic that exists in any you know supremacist society, but in any society that has marginalized people. And that for me, that's really the thing of it. Is like it's not that no one can write uh, things that don't align specifically with their identity. It's that if you belong to a class that has historically uh, been a beneficiary of the disenfranchisement of another class, I think it's kind of crummy to then take the stories of that of that disenfranchised group and, uh, it, despite how well meaning your intent is to exploit it for your own creative whatever. Um, which leads me to my response to this question, which is that if, if we acknowledge that systemic racism does indeed exist, and if we acknowledge that one of its effects is the disenfranchisement of minority groups, and if we acknowledge that there are talented and capable composers and librettists that belong to those groups, then in this present day, I think it is completely unethical for white people to write a black opera or to write any opera that represents a, a marginalized group in America. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, Dr. Lee. Yes, another good question. Um, can white men write black opera? Um, it has nothing to do with culture, has to do with your talent, your skill, and also um, uh, your knowledge as to that culture you're writing about. And with, in particular, with African Americans, with Asian Americans, with uh, Native Americans, Hollywood, thanks to Hollywood and the movie industry, has been so uh, 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 damaging to the image of these uh, marginalized groups of people. So when you go into the opera and the storytelling and the stage, we have to be very, very careful that we're not getting harmful images or characters, not intentionally, as uh, if you read the article, uh, the uh, Ken White Men write black operas, what happened, the, the writers didn't intentionally uh, stereotype these black characters, but they did. And I understand Lena Horne wouldn't even take the role. So, um, but of course, uh, people from different cultures can write about other cultures, but again, with the underrepresented or mar marginalized group of people, we must be very careful that we're not putting out harmful images 
of these people. And it's not intentionally, it's just the writer really was not knowledgeable of the culture. George, for, uh, George Gershwin lived in the black culture. He would go up to Harlem to the Cotton Club and different places and get to know the jazz musicians. Um, so I could see him ending up with the Porgy and Bess. But whereas these other writers who are mentioned in this article really, you know, they knew about the minstrels, they would see Black people from afar, and they would just see these distorted characters. So consequently, they brought it into their art form because that's how they saw Black people. And uh, it's unfortunate, but um, there's been such hundreds of years of history of this. We have to be very, very careful if we're cross-culturally a, a uh, story in opera or play or movie or any other medium. That's, again, that's in my experience. Yeah. And I don't know if you agree or not, <laughs> but that's how I, I, what I see it as. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we see the, the ways that we value one person's or an individual's not or observation because it's not a lived experience right observation of another right in the ways to tell stories about that and yes. i appreciate also dylan in bringing into the space um, when we're looking at activism when we're looking at correcting systemic oppression um, how we we pay attention we value intent just as dr lee said uh, we prioritize impact right so even if the intent is one thing, what is the impact? And when we find that those two things do not align, how do we adjust? If uh, we had the intention of making an opera and it has the impact of being extremely tragic and harmful to a community, how do we adjust? How do we adjust and say, ooh, okay, my bad. I'm gonna keep that in my mama's basement. Ooh, I'm gonna put that over there. And let's try something different. So I love, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Michael, you are bringing it, bringing it home for us. Uh, good, sir. Uh, can, <laughs> can it happen? Well, I suddenly had a thought that's, not, that's only tangentially related because I was, you know, was thinking about slavery and, and that topic in operas which are Black or which are not Black. And I was also just thinking about the topic of storms and you know, when are we going to see an opera about Hurricane Katrina because storms feature so prominently in so many operas, whether we're talking about Peter Grimes or Billy Budd or Barbara of Seville or um, Pori and Bess, and then Otello begins with a storm. So I'm just, just thinking about how, how topics that have always been part of opera are also very important to the Black experience. Um, you know, the question, it's, a, it's such a challenging question. I never want to answer the question with a no, but rather with a, with some version of yes, no matter what the question is. I always, I always want there to be a yes in my response. So uh, rather than asking white composers not to write about Black stories, um, I would love to say yes, but let's expand it so that the Black composers who, who have always been writing Black stories are also getting the chance. Um, because when the Gershwins produced Porgy and Bess in 1935, you know, it was the only opera of its kind. Well, it wasn't. They got the chance to do it. And they, and it was difficult for them, not that it was easy. I mean, they put their own money into it and they lost money and so forth. But so many Black composers had been writing black operas the whole time, but with no prospect of getting produced. And so I don't want to say to the Gershwins of today, stop don't write that opera. I want to say, sure, but let's make sure that the Black people who are writing Black operas are being produced as well. And uh, I'll be honest, I'm moved if a white person is so compelled by a Black story that that's what they want to write about. Um, and also, I would have to plead guilty when it comes to writing in different styles and reaching into different cultures. I mentioned the piece about Panama, which I just composed, and I've been commissioned to write music. I, this is not a joke. I was asked to write a Swedish worker song for a piece of spoken theater. I've written in every style A to Z from every different culture for theater pieces that are about all of those different cultures. And um, did I make a mistake? I hope not. I hope not. Because I'm fascinated by all of these different cultures. And when someone asks me to write something about Sweden or Panama, I just take a deep dive into that music. With Swedish music, I already knew it because I just love Swedish music and have for years. <laughs> but 
uh, I, I try to dive into the music and try to understand what makes this culture tick, what makes this music tick, and how can I, uh, as a composer, create something new, but which is honoring that tradition, which is not my own. Um, and also, I, as a as a black man, I have the a black man. I have the curious privilege or paradox or whatever you want to call it. I identify as a black man. People who pass me on the sidewalk would recognize that I'm a black man. But my roots are in Africa, in Europe, and in the Cherokee Nation. Um, perhaps evenly divided, I'm not sure. But my grandmother, for example, was a white Cherokee woman. And so I embody different cultures. Maybe I have some Swedish drops in my blood, and that's why I love that music, or Irish music, I don't know. Um, so I guess, just to summarize all of that, I'm not eager to go around telling composers to stop and to stay in their lane. But I do want to encourage composers, and particularly producers and bosses, just widen, widen your, your, your spectrum, broaden your imagination, make your stage big enough so that Black people can tell Black stories and Vietnamese people can tell Vietnamese stories and Cherokee people can tell Cherokee stories uh, in opera, in television, in film, in pop music, in radio dramas, name, name me the genre, in children's books, name me the genre. And I would love to see every different type of person, every different type of cultural experience uh, have space and opportunity and a voice in all of those genres. Thank you for that. Uh, so thank you to all three of you um, for sharing time, sharing space, sharing your wisdom, sharing your passion and your art with us in this we hear the question, can white men write black opera? And we respond, it seems in a way to expand the question perhaps with more questions, right? We'll take the Socratic method, if you will, that um, what does it mean for it to be a particular type of opera? And it does it happen because a black person writes an opera? Is anything I write because I'm black, a black opera, right? Because it's gonna come from my lens no matter what the topic is about, is anything that is written about Black people considered Black opera? Is anything that is written about Asian American um, or Asian people, Asian or Asian American opera? Or does it require that we actually have a particular voice in place? Or is it both, right? And we hear, and especially, thank you so much, Dylan, for bringing into the space. All experiences are human. All human experiences are not treated equally. All human experiences are not valued equally. So when we are in a space in particular, uh, where we're looking at systemic challenges and oppression, and we have identities that disproportionately benefit from the system, it's the question of, of course, the creator should be able to create, go ahead, create. How are we ensuring that as creators, we are not silencing the voices of other creators because people tend to hear our voice first? So we have all these beautiful questions, all this beautiful music, all of this beautiful art form to explore and to find our way through it. I am going to thank each and every one of you so very much for spending time with us. I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Tara Melvin to kind of let us know what our next steps are. Do we have time to answer some questions? Are we saying goodbye to the people? How would you like to rock this? All right. Thank you all so much for being here. And we will jump to the time thing because I know we're about 10 minutes over. As I, I told our panelists, um, we have the room. So if anyone wants to stick around and ask questions, um, talk about some things, I see that there are a few comments that I can lift up. I am happy to be here. If anyone needs to, to put their church finger out up and, and sneak on out, um, then that is fine too. But we do have the room. No one is obligated to stay. Um, I wanna thank all of you before we continue. I wanna thank all of you for being here because this is not an easy conversation. Racism, inequality, inequity do not get solved in an hour, but the without the conversation starting, they don't get solved at all. 
Um, so I, I appreciate that. And before anyone has to tip on out, um, we do have a resource list that I have posted in the chat. In that list are links to the websites of our panelists. Um, I also have, uh, we have video resources and um, we also have some books that we referenced as well as um, databases that specialize in composers of color, that resource list. All of this will be on the internet on New Orleans Opera's website and YouTube next week. So do not fret. Um, and I just wanted to say lack of representation is an issue that cannot be solved with a 60 minute conversation. The work continues and we're going to keep on moving. So Quo, if you would like to jump back in, feel free. It Hi. is... I will, if that's okay, because yeah. we've had a conversation that really embodies and calls upon our identities. I want to invite everybody, if you'd like to, to kind of be mindful of our bodies, to roll our shoulders back. Notice if we were holding in some stuff, because, you know, sometimes we get into this conversation, we're like, you know what, I'm tired of this question. I'm tired of having to answer this question. <laughs> and to roll the shoulders forward. And I just want to be in the space and to create as I am. Uh, and we deserve that, of course, uh, without having to earn it because we are inherently worthy of such space and creativity just in our humanity. So I always wanna make sure that our humanity is centered. With that humanity comes the capacity, the ability and the community necessary to start to sift out some of the reasons we divide and create hierarchy over ourselves and for those of us who are impacted by it in a disproportionate way. So make sure you're moving your body, roll your neck straight in a healthy way. I will unpin our amazing panelists beginning with myself. And in that way, if anyone has questions and you want to ask questions or have conversation, we'll go from there. For our panelists, if you'd like to head out, that is completely okay as well. We are grateful, so very grateful for your time and for your brilliance. Before anyone jumps in, um, I want to lift up this, this comment from Carolyn. Uh, Sebron, who had to um, leave us. And it says, um, I've got to go, but I want to add to the discussion that many operas about African-Americans are based in tragedy. There are many other stories that can reflect the rich fabric of the African-American story or that of Haiti or Brazil or people of African descent in Central and South America. And of course, that of course the continent, Mansa Musa being one or even not a tragedy, but a love story or a comedy. Thank you for your interesting perspectives. And I know that is a, a topic that we all talk about quite a lot. Why, why do we have to see stories based in tragedy? So I'm gonna open it right to any of our panelists to speak, but I think it's a combination of two things. One, we tend to require that opera be tragic. And what that means for the psyche, what that means for kind of mental engagement and all of those other things, we continue to explore that. Um, opera's fascination with tragedy uh, just in so many things because for some reason we create we equate drama to tragedy. Add on top of that the fact that people are taking an outsider's perspective to kind of speak to the human tragedy of a particular group. To me, it says if I was constantly being invited to uh, my best friend's house, and when I'm in my best friend's house, something particularly happens every time, right? Because that's all I see. So now that's all I'm going to write about. Or that's all we talk about. That's all I value. So then that's what I'm going to write about. And now my best friend has been defined in such a way. In a nation in particular where racism impacts us daily, where racism um, impacts who, it, racism actively separates and silos communities, then we start to get um, we start to get flooded with stories that are considered the experience of an entire community because it's been told from the perspective of someone who's been from the outside. And even when we have, when I say outside, from someone who does not have the experience. And even when we do start to tell stories, those that tend to be, and tragedy is there, it doesn't mean that it should not be, it should be there. 
but it gets flooded with tragedy because then those become kind of what the audience is used to engaging with. We have all these stories about slavery. We have all these stories about sorrow, all these stories about et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to the point where I've heard it so many times. Oh, Park and Bess is the Black experience. Oh, don't you love blue? What would I, listen, no, no diss to the, the story, the composition. Why would, I, why would I just love blue? What? It hurts. And so when it's so flooded to the point where all there is is hurt, why would communities want to engage? It does not mean the hurt should not be there. I do believe that it means that it should not be what solely defines someone's presence within such a grand art form. So that's my spiel. I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna pass it <laughs> to anyone else who'd like to have a conversation about that or to like to speak on it. Michael, go for it. And then Dr. Lee, I see. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you said. I also noticed a trend in 20th and 21st century opera that the world of opera leans towards tragedy in general. Uh, whereas if you go back a century or two before, then it seems there was a much more even balance uh, where you had people like Rossini just churning out comedies. Um, yeah, so I, I think in general, the genre leans that way, plus a certain societal expectation that black stories are tragic stories uh, added on to that. And also just something very fundamental. I think tragedy as a genre has changed very little since antiquity. If someone dies, that's a tragedy. And that's always been true in the whole history of theater. What is funny, however, I think changed it a lot. Sometimes something that was funny last year is not funny today anymore. And so that, that, that just means it's more difficult to create comedy that, that is funny. Uh, and that will be funny in the next production like it was in this production. Um, also, I'm just thinking of, you know, weeping and doers for a night, but joy comes in the morning. In a way, for myself, sometimes I feel like I need to get the tragic stories out before I'm ready and, and light enough to laugh. Um, so maybe that's partly also happening in the genre, that, that the tragic stories are just banging, banging down the door. And then when they're out, maybe the comedies will start coming. I don't know. Um, another thing is that it's much more difficult to write comedy than it is to write tragedy. And part of the reason is that you get an immediate grade from the audience. So if you're doing a tragic opera and you're on stage, there's no way to know in real time how the audience is feeling. If you're doing a comedy, you know. If you, if you do the punchline and no one laughs, you know it's a bad joke. So that, I mean, that just makes it, it makes it much more difficult. And, um, and the rhythm of comedy is, I mean, it's, much, it's just much more difficult, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more difficult to write a comedy. Um, but I don't want to, I, I, let me put that out there as a challenge for all of you writers and librettists listening in. Just throwing it out there. Comedy is really difficult. I wonder where the next one will come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's difficult, but it's also something with which communities excel. And that has been truncated and limited by those who have been controlling which repertoire gets put out, right? And I love that you said it may not be funny next time, right? It's funny now, it may not be funny in a year. Um, and yet we, we always find a space for it and what that means for the creativity of, uh, of all of our creators. So that is true, it's a challenge um, that Michael has put out. <laughs> in support and what it looks like and also what it means. You said, right, that it's going to look different. It's going to feel different. Audiences will expect something different. What it means for us to also start to shape in and usher an audience that also takes joy with the joy of the story that's being presented, right? Takes joy in and with the stories that are being presented because it's possible, right? It's just a matter of how do we start to shift um, so that there, not that there is more space, so that we take that space. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Lee, and then uh, Dylan, of course, if you want to hop in, go for it. Um, when I was in college, I did the developmental stages of African-American composers as a project in graduate school. And I find what we have to look at is where are we in the mainstream of composition? and I don't think we ever left the post-romantic period, which was preoccupied by death, tragedy. 
um, even though people feel, well, we've been experimental, it's modern music, um, there are different things going on, abstract expressionism, but I, I see us still, because of this reoccurring theme of tragedy and death, and of course, this pandemic did not help us <laughs> get out of this sort of rut, I'm saying, that we seem to be in. Um, so I think you have to look at the whole spectrum of today, if we're looking at what's being written today, one positive thing about what I like about the young um, composers of opera in particular, they're taking historic themes, they're taking the Harriet Tubman, they're taking the Malcolm X, they're making the um, operas an opportunity to inform the public of, of historical characters. I, I think that's that's just um, outstanding of these young composers to do. I think though we need to reach back into our past. For instance, uh, St. George wrote six operas. I believe three were comedies and they were very successful. They People liked his comedies more than his serious operas. So, I think we have to look at, well, Florence Price has written four operas. I don't know where they call me serious or what. I know Dorothy Rudd Moore wrote uh, the Frederick Douglass, and so did uh, Ulysses K wrote Frederick Douglass. Uh, H.L. Freeman wrote the African Crawl opera, The Voodoo Queen. Uh, Grant Still, we know, had The Trouble Island. So wide variety of, uh, we had the Tremonisha by Scott Joplin. All these are operas that have, have been neglected by the mainstream. So we really haven't had that opportunity as a group to uh, present uh, our, our best in our operas publicly. And uh, it's unfortunate, but this is a, a serious, um, area that we need to work on some type of action plan to bring these operas to the forefront that are being neglected because to wait 138 years before a opera by a black composer is being performed and we have hundreds of years of operas i mean is is really ridiculous i know we need to celebrate because it finally happened but at the same time it's a tragedy that it took that long to occur and we had so much talent and so many operas that are out there that have just gone unheard i remember i met uh, the first time i met um uh dr delerma at the academy of music in philadelphia at an opera ebony performance and he told me when i told him i was first black to graduate from University of Pennsylvania and all. He said, oh my goodness, he, we had no idea you were out there. He said, you need to let people know who you are. And uh, composers in particular that are of uh, African-American or minority or underrepresented have a problem with branding uh, where the uh, composers in the mainstream, there more support there. But now, you know, we do have many organizations that are there, such as your organization that are trying to reach out and help these uh, underrepresented uh, composers. But um, I thought that you have to really look at, well, where are we at in, in, in composing? Where are we at? And my, in my opinion, I still, I see us, we're still struck uh, we're still stuck on this uh, death, this tragedy, this, oh my goodness. And um, it, it's, it may be a rut. Hopefully we'll get out of it when this pandemic, you know, is behind us. And we can go to more lighter or, or uh, musical themes and ideas in our stories. But I thought I'd share that aspect with you. And one other thing, I had a professor, I'm nameless, who once said that, you know, the problem is that he believed we were in a Rococo period where there really wasn't any one style that's liked or unlikable. But from my viewpoint, I think we still are sort of in that post-romantic rut of death and tragedy being that thing that's, you know, holding our um, creativity right now in the world of opera anyway. But that's my personal <laughs> opinion. Of course, thank you for sharing. Yeah, Dylan. Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, I have a few different thoughts about it. I, and this this is speaking more towards like the, uh, this is like a personal, this is one's own decision to write about one's own tragedy. I, I can't, I'm not really speaking on like 
of taking like a group's tragedy and then like deciding to kind of throw it on a stage in front of thousands of people. But I know for me, you know, I'm sitting here thinking like there is a degree of, uh, I don't know, there's something therapeutic about taking your own hurt and, and turning it into art. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm listening to you all chat and I'm thinking, I think there's a lot of healing to be had in uh, the joy also and in the play and in the fun. Um, uh, I don't really have any solid thoughts, but I will I will share with you that I'm I'm working on a chamber opera right now that takes place in a comedy club during an open mic night. And um, I'm hoping it'll be funny. Uh, <laughs> based off that context. Um, it loosely follows like kind of a Cinderella type thing. And, you know, she doesn't want to go up on stage and then she gains confidence and then, uh, you know, and then she like ends up signing a contract or something. Uh, but it, it will take place in a comedy club and I'm, and I'm hoping that will, uh, I'm hoping it'll be funny enough for the setting. Um, but maybe I can send it to y'all. You can take a peek beforehand and let me know what you think. The music nerd in me would love that, first of all. The music oh, I have one more nerd. quick thought. Uh -huh. You inspired me, Dylan. I just realized that so many of the great comedies of today are written by writers' rooms rather than by single writers, whereas in the tradition of opera, usually it's just one person creating the libretto. And part of what makes uh, comedy great in other genres is that you have a room full of people who are throwing ideas back and forth and constantly getting that immediate feedback. Oh, I threw out my idea and no one laughed. Okay, going on to the next one. If you're alone trying to write a comedy, it's much more difficult to gauge what's funny. Uh, I know because I am usually the only one who's laughing at my own jokes. <laughs> but I'm also noticing that in the field of opera, the, the Broadway workshopping process is starting to catch on so that people are no longer retiring to a villa in Tuscany to write their opera. They're doing it in constant collaboration uh, with other writers and performers and conductors. And that process, I think, yields, it can yield great comedy. So I hope that that Broadway style of working and collaborating and creating might yield some wonderful new uh, operatic comedies. Mm -hmm. I'll, be I'll be stealing that, Michael. Thank you. Let's and collaborate, please. <laughs> please do. Everybody collaborate. I'm a, I would freak out just so that you know. Uh, I I also love the the idea that as we have this conversation, yes, it is difficult because of kind of the reception, and I also believe that that's because again we have audiences who are used to uh, experiencing a certain type of thing when they come to opera, but we also have other audiences who are saying, "Where's the joy? Where is the fill in the blank? Where is this? Where is that?" So we see a need for it as we uh, look to represent the full human spectrum on the stage, we see a need for it. Um, and I appreciate the additional kind of thought process of perhaps we have to create it a different way because it is so different uh, to what we're used to right now. I see hands up in the space. We will go to uh, Dr. Tara and then Sakina. And if I said that wrong, please make sure that uh, I am corrected. That was wrong. <laughs> so I just want to, we, the, the comment section started going off. I got very excited. I just wanted to lift up some of these comments. So Dr. Davis, who, you know, it, it, is Sakina, um, um, said to add to, to add to the older comic repertoire, Robert Owens wrote a comic opera, Culture, Culture. Um, and she said, I think it's called, it, it's in German and English. Um, and Edmond Dede wrote comic operas of which Miss Giovanna Joseph of Opera Creole said he did write comedy. Um, but something that I just wanted to throw out. So before I throw that out, that means that at least in the 1800s, <laughs> there were black people writing comedy and we all know how, or I hope we all know how famous Edmond Dede was when he wasn't in the U.S. as opposed to when he was in the U.S. Um, and that's a whole other set of conversations, probably for next season. Um, but also, I wanted to throw out, we we kind of hold on to Porgy and Bess, and, and this is just a thought I wanted to throw out there. We kind of hold on to Porgy and Bess as um, it is seen in many circles because it is in the canon as the quintessential Black American opera. 
Uh, but there it has been research done um, and we had this panelist on another panel and I hope to bring her back next year where she, um, there is a woman in New Orleans who is a Porgy and Bess scholar, who is a Gershwin and Gullah scholar. And what Dr. Lee said was absolutely correct. Gershwin went and lived with these people. He had no intention of this opera being the quintessential black opera, he wanted to re represent the Gullah people as they were, what they were doing. And there is research and there are sound recordings. And when he died and when DuBose Haywood died, all of the, everything that made this opera specific to a certain group of people that he studied was stripped away because it was seen as not necessarily marketable. They, they talked about the language as being something that would be prohibitive, which I find ridiculous because operas are in different languages all the time. So that's just something to throw out for the next conversation maybe. And I'm going to back out of the conversation again and I will hand it over to Dr. Davis. Thank you, Dr. Melvin. So first of all, thank you to all the panelists um, for your um, your insight. And it's been really, really interesting listening to this conversation. Um, I have all the questions and I'm super fired up. So I'm gonna try to calm myself down. <laughs> um, but one thing that struck me with um, Maestro Ingram talking about um, how, you know, the idea of opera morphing into something that we can't recognize. I feel something similar when you look at R&B, right? As a genre. Because when it started in the 1940s as this hybrid genre of music anyway, it's definitely not where it is right now. And so many people have asked, is R&B still a thing? Is R&B still alive? And I've asked that question myself um, before, because, you know, I grew up in the 90s. I grew up listening to soul. And so I don't, I, you know, I feel like, you know, somebody who's like, oh, these young people don't know what real music is. I feel like that sometimes. But when I started looking at the history of R&B, I was like, no, this has been meant to change and morph. It always has been. And you have these traditions that are still time honored traditions, but it's morphed into something else now. And my question, I guess, is um, there was nobody, I guess, who had a lasso on R&B and said R&B must be maintained as it was in the 1950s for the sake of whatever. And with opera, you've had that lasso. And maybe this is too big of a question, but like who decided to put the lasso on opera? Who was in the room where that decision was made? Cause like that, I feel like will help us understand how to like unmake the decision. <laughs> I, I, I'll jump in. I think it's helpful for me to consider the question in the broader context of what was going on classical music, especially shifting from the 19th to the 20th century. Um, so in the earlier days, Baroque music, classical music, early romantic music, composers and conductors and performers and orchestral musicians and singers, they were all the same people. So it was rare for someone who did own thing, they played well and sing. Almost everyone involved in the world of what we now call classical music was doing all of those different things. Uh, and many people in the audience were also musicians and composers themselves. And so there was a kind of loveliness in exchanging ideas and evolving for the art form. As things slowly shifted, where you had people specializing in only one thing, and where you had an audience of people who did not play music, then I think the possibilities become more limited, and also the openness to different styles is just more limited because there are fewer people involved in the conversation. Um, and then, of course, as music starts to move away from tonality, I think other people really in dances were saying, oh, wait, we, we like we liked the major and minor chords. We want to hang on to that. Um, and also just the idea of a classical canon uh, uh, evolving and becoming very ossified uh, as we have it today, because that, I, that concept didn't exist earlier. As soon as Beethoven was done with one symphony, he was writing the next one. He wasn't expecting that same symphony to be performed thousands of times uh, all over. And the composers who did have works repeated, say Mozart moving Don Giovanni from one city to another, he was making changes. If the work was repeated, it was filled with change because it was a new play, new singers. Uh, so the idea of a 
piece being treated by a piece from a museum that's performed the same way all over the world for centuries. This was completely foreign to all of the composers that we perform today. Think about how many composers died in the middle of writing their final piece. Beethoven left his 10th unfinished, Mahler left his 10th symphony unfinished, um, and you could go right down the list of people who, Bruckner left his ninth, un, ninth unfinished, Puccini left Turandot unfinished. unfinished. Composers just, they weren't about to stop. Um, so yeah, that idea of an ossified canon is it's changed. And it's very exciting to see lots of opera companies, including Portland Opera, including the Metro Opera, including the Met, just expanding things and getting more new works and new works that are engaging, new works that are not designed to be avant-garde, but works that are designed to tell stories and to move people. Um, Dylan, go for it. And then I will have Ms. Divana uh, ask her question. And I think I'm gonna pass it back to, to Dr. Melvin because we could be here all night and I'm okay with that, but I wanna honor everybody's <laughs> time as well. I, I have to head out in like a few minutes. Um, but I just, I, to respond to Dr. Davis's question um, or to Dr. Davis's point, I think a lot of it is also about um, money and the accessibility of that music making. You know, we all know that opera is very expensive. Um, and uh, in, until we move to a more democratically um, funded uh, model, then we're, we're literally just going to have the people who are paying for it have more to say, right? You know, um, which is why many companies are tr trying, it's difficult, but trying to move toward a democratically funded model. Um, as opposed to popular music, which, although it, there is still like many degrees of inaccessibility in popular music, um, like it's definitely cheaper than putting on an opera. Uh, like I think making R and B album, and and I'm you know I'm like I'm talking out of my um, I can't say that I'm I'm speaking without solid basis, uh, but. Yeah, I, I think especially like nowadays with the dawn of like accessible, not the dawn, but with the perpetuation of accessible recording equipment, um, you're getting a lot, I don't know, popular music is just more democratically accessible, I think, than classical music. And um, I also believe that it is those, that access is so important. It's the access, it's the funds, and it's the influence. If we are mindful of the ways in which we got R&B, of the ways in which music, especially from the nation of the United States of America, so much of it comes out of the Black community, right? So if we look at what was simul where we were simultaneously being kept out of, what else continued to move? What else continued to progress? What else continued to influence entire cultures worldwide? As we look at this space for opera, I think it's a matter of access. And I think it's a matter of um, kind of connection to the people in the space and the people um, who are coming into the space or leaving the space. I think of Tchaikovsky's double, double bill, like imagine doing a double bill, right, in 2022. I'd love it, but you know, imagine people like, oh no. Uh, but I think of Tchaikovsky's double bill of Nutcracker and Yolanta, and they couldn't stand Nutcracker. Like they, they were not here for it. Now, how often do we see Yolanta? if people know about it but you know come come this holiday season we out there we out there with the sugar plum fairies we making it happen every year right and as we we look at how meaningful things or how things become meaningful or less meaningful to groups also i think includes how much we invest in it and how much access people have to it so that's my spiel gonna go with Miss Giovanna and then we're gonna go back to to Dr. Melvin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well we at Opera Creole we're always uh getting asked the question of what is black opera and what is what is 19th century free composers of color what did it sound like? Was there something in it that sounded black? And so I'm always in this conversation. Um you know we're we're the only company, first company in New Orleans to do a full production, Tree Manisha. Only company in New Orleans to do a full production, Will Grant Stills, Minette Fontaine. And our mission is really to bring the people out of the grave, you know, 
Um, and I know there's a movement to new music, so I will uh, I will just say that I really I really wish we could compel white composers to collaborate to make sure not not just the librettist, but to do what what Gershwin did to go into the scenarios and not having just an idea of what that would look like or sound like. But I want to pose to you all a totally different question. What is black opera, right? For my class at Loyola, I found this, I don't know if y'all can see this, book called Blacks in Tudor England. And I have always started my lecture with, with John Blank, who was a, a, an employed, paid royal trumpeter in the 1500s to Kings Henry VII and VIII. And this book starts to talk about the Moors, how they expanded into Europe. And I wonder, what our role may have been in the formation of this art form. So was, was opera always black? That's, that's a conversation that I'd like to look at. So I'm gonna throw that out to you all. What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? I, mean, well, I, I love that you bring up black or Moorish trumpeters because uh, the theater in Germany where I, I was a Kapellmeister up until recently, uh, it's an orchestra that's been in exi existence since that same time period. Um, and a colleague of mine at the theater was doing research in the wake of Black Lives Matter and discovering that there were Black or so-called Moorish trumpeters and drummers or timpanists, um, even going back centuries. That was, for whatever reason, a, a nook or a niche where uh, Black Europeans flourished or where Black Africans who were in Europe for whatever reason uh, were, were flourishing. Right. And the fact that John Blank was able to get a raise out of Henry VIII, I, I think, you know, he just, he needs, it needs to be a statue somewhere. The man that was beheading people gave this black man a raise. So he must have been good, right? Uh, and, and it is a conversation to kind of look at to see what was our original as we expanded. And at the time in the in 1600s, originally as free people, we expanded into Europe and we were employed and this book talks about different things that they did for a living. Mm -hmm. um, that it maybe it's a conversation uh, exploration that should be made that we that maybe we have always all music is black music is what I'm saying we've always influenced it we've always had a role in it. And, and I think we're stuck now because so, uh, so many opera companies are kind of held, the reins are held by the donors and, and the people that have been, you know, and so it, it's, we're kind of stuck. But I think that it, will, it will, will morph. I think that we need to do honor to the people that we left behind and that are still in the grave waiting. Um, and I do think that we just like the Opera Alliance and, you know, we had these statements, I think that we should compel white stories or white composers to really do the work and not just write something. I have an opera that was sent to me called um, Congo Square and both the composer and the librettist are white. And I'm afraid to touch it. I just don't, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I don't, and he's writing me, so what do you think? So I've got to sit down and look at it, but it makes me a little nervous. I don't really know what to do with it, tell you the truth. <laughs> don't don't be scared to look at it. The worst that can happen is that it's bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the worst case is that it's and, bad. and can I just say thank you, Miss Joseph and Dr. Davis for performing my Adea excerpt wonderfully in March. I, like it. I, I love what um, Miss Joseph is doing at Opera Creole because what I've learned from studying the French painters, that Impressionist movement was so important because those painters were all outside of academia. They were not necessarily the most popular or well-known or famous painters in the time uh, in France. So you can never really write off a composer or a musician or a performer because today often it is money and more money and economics for you to get out there in the forefront as a composer. And you have to be a performer because if you look at the 
the composers today, Valerie Coleman, the um, uh, Romaine, you're looking at all these composers are, are really fantastic performers and they're able to get their music out there. Um, a second thing I want, not only thank you to Opera Creel, but I wanted to say about Dr. Davis, I wanted to piggyback off of that about opera being, there's a lasso, a no, what happened in, this is what's beautiful about the Black American culture is that Miles Davis invented something called fusion, where you take two styles of music and you bring them together. Who says you can only have one style of music or one type of art form and not do different things with it? So our our Black culture here in the United States has so been so in innovative that we've created jazz, blues, our uh, R&B, uh, hip hop, you know, now. So you really have to look at that. And uh, I think it's so wonderful what you're doing in New Orleans, uh, not only Opera Creole, but the New Orleans Opera Company. I wish everyone would do what you're doing now because these conversations need to be had before we can get anything done. And thank all of you so much tonight for all of this. This was wonderful. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. I do see a hand up and I'm going to, uh, and this will be our last, and then we really will turn it over to, to Dr. Dr. Tara Melvin. Thank you. Uh, Christian Roberts, go for it. I really tried to not talk because, <laughs> because but I come by it honestly, I'm, I'm a daughter of two, two educators, one, one of whom is a, a preacher. But when we, when you, I, I love the, the question of have we always been here? Yes, we have. Because even opera has its root in Egyptian uh, religious ceremonies. And we know, we knew about the Greeks and the Romans. We know they were over there in, in, with our people uh, in Africa. And these religious ceremonies morphed into something, but they were theatrical in nature, right? You had speeches, you had you know, some version of preaching. You probably had some sacrifices and different things like that. And in between all that were instrument and voices and drama. So yes, we have always been there. I was the annoying person in Waco Hall at Baylor University, raising my hand to the music professors going, but where were the black people? Where were the brown people? Because I know it's just not restricted to this Northern anthology and this history of Western music. That's my take for the night. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so with that, yes, and I, I do agree, it's that we've always been there. And then even uh, Dylan, he brought forth the idea that we are telling story through song and drama and music and visual storytelling that has been going on since human beings could talk to each other and realize that we could make organized sound, which is what we call music. Opera being the plural of opus, which means many works, and I say this so often, can fit many stories, many experiences, many, many more connections. So I encourage all of us to continue to consider what it means to claim our space um, and to do so joyfully, to do so in a way that allows us to expand not just how we tell our stories, but how we connect through the storytelling that we do, whether it's tragic, whether it's comedic, whether it's romantic, whether it is dramatic, all of these other things um, in this art form that has to continue to shift with the people. So with that, I pass it back to Dr. Tara Melvin. I am so grateful to each and every one of you for your time, for your energy, um, as well as for the additional time. Dr. Tara Melvin. Thank you so much, Quo. Thank you to all of our panelists. I, this was literally a Hail Mary. Uh, we thought of this, I didn't even come up with this one as subversive as the title sounds. It actually was Claire Borovac, our general and artistic director who came to me with the article last year, right after I started working for New Orleans Opera. And I looked at her and I was just like, so you just want a reason to fire me, I think. Um, but she was like, no, we're going to do it. And I cannot, I could not have dreamt for the people that shared their time and their wisdom and were vulnerable in a space that has not allowed for us as Black people, for other people, um, for, for Asian American people, for, for 
other non-white people to be vulnerable. So I, that does not go um, unnoticed. And I cannot thank you all enough um, for, and I hope to speak to all of you again soon, because I feel like this is a bigger conversation and it's, it's ro going to roar like a lion eventually. Um, with that being said, to our audience, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being so attentive. Um, 15 of y'all rode with us for, for almost two hours, and I cannot thank you enough for that. If you have any additional questions or if you want to see more programming like this, because this is the first time we're trying this at New Orleans Opera, feel free to reach out to myself or to us on social. However, um, However you feel comfortable reaching out, you can flag me down on the street. Y'all know I will talk to you at any time and for any reason. Um, thank you again. I cannot believe it's been two hours. I hope to speak to all of you so, so very soon. And I hope to see all of you and in true Southern fashion, hug all of your necks. And um, I hope to see you next time. Next week's conversation, we are going to talk about reconstructing operas in the canon through the lens of today examining Don Giovanni and the Me Too movement. So I hope to see you there. Thank you. Bye.